I am Flavia Zimmerman from the Australian Institute of International Affairs in Western Australia and today we have with us Honorary Fellow from the School of Law at the University of Western Australia, Jun Wang, and we'll be discussing the Chinese One Belt, One Road Initiative. Thank you for being with us, Jun. It's my pleasure. Jung, um, could you please explain to us um, exactly what comprises the One Belt, One Road initiative? Yes, thank you for the question. I think we have this very helpful picture behind us, and that uh, perfectly explains the uh, One Belt, One Road initiative. Uh, in words, this One Belt, One Road initiative is comprised of two, um, two phrases or two parts. Part one is One Belt, which refers to the ancient silk road uh, route, which is land-based initiative. And then you see the sea-based uh, route, which is called uh, sea, uh, maritime silk road in the 21st century, or 21st century uh, maritime silk road route. So that uh, uh, com um, constitutes the second part, the one road initiative. So uh, it is called one, be one belt, one road, or in China, in brief, Words they just called it uh, belt and road, uh, in Chinese, uh, 一带一路 or 带路. And um, could you please um, just explain to us, Jung, um, to which extent the One Belt, One Road initiative will impact trade relations around the world, in particularly economic integration with Eurasia? Yes, this is a very uh, good question, a very interesting question. Now, in my view, um, I think this initiative will be of strategic importance to the uh, Eurasia region because uh, of its size uh, and, and uh, the uh, uh, sums of money that will be injected along a lot of countries, around 70 countries uh, and jurisdictions along these two uh, roads. One uh, belt road and the other one is obviously the maritime road. Uh, so I think the strategic importance may be um, divided into three uh, parts. Part one, I think, that may go to um, uh, the country's uh, desire to um, tackle its own overcapacity problems domestically. Because after you know, so many years of developments domestically in China, China has accumulated very strong technical expertise in particular in construction and engineering fees. You see a lot of you know, very, very uh, impressive roads, uh, airports, railways domestically in China. And they have a lot of experience there. And I think a part of one of the strategic importance goes to the uh, government desire to uh, export its, its over uh, supplies, uh, oh, sorry, over capacity uh, and expertise that has been accumulated domestically in China. So that is number one. Number two, uh, the, the part two of strategic importance, I think, uh, goes to um, China's desire to uh, to to influence, if you like, um, its neighbors uh, in a number of ways, both uh, in a cultural ways and also uh, in a attempt to try to counterbalance the, the impact or influence of the United States uh, in the region or its you know in its neighboring countries, because currently China. Chinese government do not feel very, uh, if you like, comfortable with the uh, situation surrounding its territory. Uh, and uh, obviously it wants to do something to try to counterbalance the, uh, the impact of the United States government, especially the, the premium government, the former government, Obama government, where obviously they had, they had a strategy of rebalancing uh, in Asia and getting back or returning to Asia. So China was not very comfortable with, with, with that, so it wants to do something. So naturally, uh, it wants to uh, uh, in expand its, its influence, both ge geographic uh, and culture and um, economic uh, influence around its neighbors. So that's part two of strategic importance, I think. Uh, part three, I think, um, of the strategic importance, um, I think uh, perhaps will go to my own area, namely the international law area, namely, uh, you see, China has uh, you know lots of um, outbound investment projects and more and more you know investment projects in in various parts of the world, not just 
the one belt, one road countries, but also countries like Australia and the United States, Canada and uh, you know, other um, developed countries, Britain, etc. So one difficulty or one challenge the Chinese government or the business community in China faces is the so-called international legal infrastructure or framework. Because currently, to be frank, this legal framework is pretty much dominated by the Western world, if you like. Pretty much dominated, say, inch law or New York law. It's, 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 you know, the international conventions are pretty much driven by or dominated by the uh, United States, UK, and the EU, European Union. Okay, so that, that was, well, maybe the, the perception from China. So I think the government of China feels that um, the One Belt, One Road, uh, initiative is a very important opportunity for it to change change this structure a little bit by uh, voicing its own position in the international legal framework. Uh, and the easiest uh, targets, if you like, will be those neighboring countries or countries in the Euro Asia countries where we know there are a lot of uh, challenges there. So, um, more specifically, I would say the government of China wants to perhaps wants to um, um, negotiate and sign a lot of bilateral and multilateral legal treaties covering investment, covering trade, covering um, technology transfer, etc. various uh, areas of commerce and, and business uh, where it can have more side in terms of rights and obligations around these countries. So I think that might be a uh, interesting uh, factor or a strategic or factor of strategic importance in the minds of the Chinese government. So it wants to maybe it wants to um, uh, restructure the international legal framework for investor protection and uh, you know investment promotion, things like that in, in, in the world. So I would say that perhaps the easiest way is to to do this through this initiative where they will be pretty much the financer themselves, and therefore, presumably, they could have stronger side in terms of you know rights, obligations, treaties, things like that. And later on, they may uh, you know try to use that uh, as a leverage to you know to renegotiate uh, you know treaties with the United States, you know Britain, Australia, you know more developed jurisdictions. So I think that might be the third part of strategic importance. Why the free trade agreements? Or investment protection and promotion agreements, things like that. Yeah, so that's that's my own view as to so-called um, strategic importance of this one belt one road initiative. Mm -hmm. Fascinating, Jim. Thank you. For more information, please visit our website www.internationalaffairs.org.au. Thank you. Thank you very much.